Building Trust in AI. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Dr. Alexandra Musilovich, IBM Fellow, Head of AI Foundation at IBM Research, and Co-Director of IBM Science for Social Good. Welcome, Sashka. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What is the mission of the AI Foundations at IBM? Well, so it's a part of our um, IBM Research AI, and uh, so I would like to say we are the geeks. We are the ones who are really looking at, you know, algorithmic advancements of AI and, you know, pushing the boundaries on machine learning and deep learning and reinforcement learning, and also looking into a whole bunch of interesting things. Most recently, we've done a lot of work in uh, the ethics of AI, uh, trust of AI, explainability, fairness, and that kind of stuff. What do we mean by the term trusted AI? I mean, what, what is IBM doing to build trust in artificial intelligence? Well, so, so that's kind of a, a really good and important and very timely question because uh, we are kind of embracing this, this uh, new era when we're actually seeing algorithms uh, being a part of how we make decisions about many things, you know, hire people, give loans, uh, give them bail or not, um, you know, how we drive, where we go to, a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, before that, before that, this era, we used to kind of build algorithms for accuracy or we were trying to come up with um, as impressive demonstrations of AI as possible. But now we're realizing that, you know, if you're going to, to entrust these important de decisions to a machine, you need to, to trust it for some reason. And, and, and in order to trust it, the decision has to be much more than just accurate. It has to be fair. It has to be explainable. It has to be robust and safe. It has to be accounted. You need to be able to, to account for it. And it translates into these additional traits and characteristics that we now impose on our algorithms. That means the notion of fairness, the notion of explainability, the notion of robustness, accountability, and, 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 and that in a way it translates into an engineering principle engineering principles that we as a creator creators and developers of ai should be able to instrument into our our tools and and products and solutions to to ensure that level of trust you mentioned loans for example what are some examples of how bias shows up in ai service um, so bias can actually show up in many ways. One and, and one of the, the most prevalent is through the data that we use to train the service. And first of all, we as humans are by no means perfect. So for example, in a loan service, it might mean that there were historical biases, either intentional or intentionals by the humans who used to approve the loan. So when you use that kind of data, obviously the algorithm learns what's in the data and encodes these biases and then obviously scales them out. But there are many other ways. For example, you can, as we construct these training data sets, we can do it in a way that is um, not uh, complete. So you could have a data set that will include more data points from one type of population, or say you have a bank or a branch and you give loan in one part of the country and you train your system on, on, on these data points and obviously, that system has never seen people from a different geography, so it's never going to learn something like that. So that's, these are examples of bias that come through training data, but they can, the bias can also come in because you handle the data inappropriately, massage it, transform it inappropriately, or even you select a completely inappropriate model for the task, and even uh, because you deployed um, incorrectly. So, so bias can come in in many other ways, shapes, and forms in, in, into, the, into the system. IBM recently created a toolbox to help check for and mitigate bias in AI models. What's important to know about the toolkit, Sasha? So, so I think we tried really hard to um, create a toolkit that is really comprehensive. So we tried to include as many available in algorithms from, from the community as possible. So for example, there are probably over 30 metrics that can be used to check data or algorithm for bias. 
there are nine or 10 uh, new bias uh, removing uh, algorithms, some from us, some from, from the scientific community. We try to make it very interactive and, and, and kind of uh, intuitive because the whole purpose of the toolbox is to really help people who build models, developers, uh, scientists, understand the complexities of this problem. Because, you know, bias is such a difficult thing that even if you're an expert on bias, putting it to a real practical use in, a, in an algorithm or in a system or in a project requires a lot of deep thinking. So, um, so in addition to the algorithms, the toolbox will have uh, tutorials. Uh, we have uh, three tutorials right now for different types of applications. We're planning on adding more. But the idea is to really get the community together and give them something to, to, to help them move, understand the topic and also move the needle on this topic as, as far as we can. Why is having this technology available uh, open source important? Well, because bias is such an important problem and it's, it's a, such a complex problem because even we as, as humans cannot fully agree what it means to be biased. The bias means different things to different people and specifying it for an algorithm is really hard. So, so when we have topics like that, I believe and we believe that, that we are the best off as a community. So when we work together and contribute together and share learnings and, and, and best practices and algorithms as a whole, we, we are all better off rather than, I think this is a kind of issue where one group or one person or one organization are not going to be as effective as all of us working on it together. Beyond dealing with bias and AI, AI also needs to be explainable and able to stand up to attack. How is IBM Research tackling these challenges? Well, we're kind of tackling it from many different angles. And the reason for that is this exp explanation is really another complicated thing. One glove, when it comes to explanations, one glove does not fit all because different users and different uh, applications will require different types of explanations. So for example, if you're a doctor diagnosing a patient and you're consulting an algorithm, you might better relate to it if you're seeing examples of patients who are similar to the case that you're diagnosing. Um, if you are a regulator, you actually really want to understand the total behavior of the system because you want to make sure that that system is not violating some regulatory requirements. If you're a consumer who's been denied a loan, uh, you were really interested in your particular case. So what you really want to know is why was your loan denied and perhaps what can you do to actually get it approved? So we are really trying to approach this by, by developing techniques and algorithms that capture these different notions of explainability. So for example, one really, really cute algorithm uh, that we are going to be showing at NIPS is, um, is about creative contrast of explanations. Because in many areas, the way we work as humans is not only, um, we don't know only what are the things that are important to this decision or facts that are present in the decision, but you also want to know what's absent, what's missing. Um, like for example, there, were, there was you know, the famous story of uh, Sherlock Holmes being able to diagnose a, a, the crime is because the dog did not bark, uh, which basically indicated there was someone who was familiar to the scene. So, so, so being able to also kind of explain things that are missing, that was kind of one of the things that, that um, uh, our folks did in, in, in this uh, paper called uh, Explanations Based on Missing. Um, another interesting algorithm, for example, is looking for how can we use the informa information um, from a very complex model, such as a neural net, and transfer that information to a very simple model, such as a decision tree, so that you actually end up creating much more accurate and better performing simple models that are also uh, explainable. Uh, so that's an, another example of a paper that will be presented. And so the idea is that we are kind of creating this rich, expressive vocabulary for AI, so that it can communicate with us and explain things to us in the way that really best suits the, the application or the need. 
you recently introduced the concept of fact sheets or safety labels, if you will, for AI. Can you explain what you mean by this and, and how they work exactly? Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a new concept that we're trying to champion. And, and the idea is that if you go to a store and you buy, I don't know, a hair dryer or a, a blender, whatever, or digital camera, all these things, you, know, you go buy food in the supermarket, all these things come with nutrition labels, data sheets, uh, users' manuals, like hardware has specifications. So and it's kind of really mind boggling that um, as we come to this uh, moment in time where we are putting AI algorithms and models and services into the product products or, or, or solutions, did they don't come up with anything remotely like this. So the, 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 the idea of fact sheets for AI services discloses this, this concept of, hey, the, the, the algorithm and the service should really come with certain kinds of things that outline how it was trained, what kind of data was used, um, how it was testing, what kind of performance metrics were used in the testing, uh, kinds of um, applications that it is suitable for or not suitable for. Um, and I, I want to be clear, this is a very complex concept. So I think we were just kind of introducing the idea and I think it's really important for the users and, and technologies and um, the regulators to come together and kind of further figure out, hey, what are the kinds of fact sheets that will be appropriate for certain types of applications? Obviously, one AI is not a, a one thing. There's so many different technologies used in, in many different fields and purposes and products. So, so being able to come up with these um, specs for different areas is, is kind of, I think, the next, uh, next step for us. What happens when two algorithms meet each other when they were actually expecting to meet a human? Should there be a back channel that allows AI to know when it's talking to another AI? I don't know. I, I, I would want to see that, actually. <laughs> you know, I think these days you don't even know as a human whether you're interacting <laughs> with, with, with an algorithm. So, so. Every time I'm online and I get this little customer service thingy, I first usually ask her, are you a bot? Because <laughs> you want to know, right? Why has trust in AI come to the foreground lately? I mean, what benefits can we expect when we solve this type of problem? I think it, it has come to, to foreground because we are maybe for the first time dealing with a technology that is really going to be making some decisions for us uh, that could have really profound implications on the society, on us as individuals, on groups of people. And obviously when you have a technology like that, trust is the, the thing that is the most important, the paramount of importance. Why would you entrust someone, a human or a machine with an important decision is a big question. So that's something that we really need to handle well and, and responsibly. Dr. Alexandra Moisilevich, IBM Fellow, Head of IBM Foundations at IBM Research and Co-Director of IBM Science for Social Good. Thanks for shedding some light on this, Sashka. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find more about the work that you're doing. How can they do that? Well, they can find me on Twitter, Data Priestess. Uh, they can also find me on LinkedIn and uh, I have a IBM research web page, which is very easily Googleable. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks again. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or go to my website, tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.